we are who we are and and there's a beautiful honesty in that in saying we really love what we do we're going to have fun while we do it and why not hello and welcome to the business of architecture uk i am your host ryan willard and today i have the great pleasure of speaking with peter esposito and liam spencer co-founders of anomaly an award-winning london-based architecture practice who specialize in creative office spaces and injecting new life into old buildings no matter what the sector. So Peter was a graduate of the Bartlett uh, and at Ravensbourne University. He's got a decade of experience working with internationally renowned practices. He has a great depth of experience from the commercial to the playful and has been involved in notable commercial retrofits and led on a number of residential schemes across London. Liam studied at University of Edinburgh and Westminster and oversees all retrofit projects, employing his skill for storytelling and unlocking value to deliver massing and strong brands for leasing. His unrelenting attitude to design enables him to provide support to clients' decision-making in developing a brief, protecting commercial interests and producing high-quality architecture. Anomaly have recently won planning and listed building consent for 40,000 square foot of grade two space in the heart of Shoreditch. They'll be interconnecting seven buildings, threading a new core within listed sheer walls, retaining and refurbishing key listed elements, delivering a new fully accessible terrace landscape to the rear of the building, adding mezzanines on ground floor and level four and featuring a staircase running through the building to name just a few. They've also recently been announced as finalists in the London Construction Awards for Architecture Firm of the Year. This was a great conversation. I spoke with Peter um, a couple of years back, I think during the pandemic. And since then, the business went through an enormous amount of changes. They've rebranded and restructured the company, the way they look, the way they feel, the way that they communicate. Um, this has been very uh, impactful for them in terms of opening new doors, developing new relationships, uh, and being able to work with new types of clients. We spoke about the impact of COVID-19 and um, what happened with the business, what kind of facilitated the the change, how they maintained their relationship with Third Way, um, what that relationship is now, how they support each other, how they work together and the existing harmony that's been created. And we also look at the company culture and their hiring philosophy, um, how they build team, how they've been able to foster and maintain a very unique sense of personality uh, and a unique creative vision in the practice. Really fascinating conversation. Brilliant to be speaking with Peter and Liam again. So sit back, relax and enjoy Peter Esposito and Liam Spencer. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Peter and Liam, welcome back to the Business of Architecture. How are you? All good, good mate. Good. All yeah, pucker. You all right? <laughs> I'm very good. Yeah. I'm very good. You like you always never tell anyone that you've just spoken for the past fifteen minutes as if we just chatted. I so, know. I know. That's part of the, the, the secrets. Yeah. That's the Hollywood. That's the Hollywood yeah. element of it. It looks like we've the just magic arri- of podcasting. We've, we've, we've just arrived on a call, and it's 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 all fresh. That's why that's why when 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 the the pre conversation gets too good, I have to stop it because sometimes yeah. it, it it burns up all the all the all the juice. And I ask oh, us, wow. I, I ask the same question <laughs> again in the podcast, and then you and then you go. Oh, we just spoke about that. I was like, no, we just yeah. spoke about that. Uh, we've got loads of juice. Don't worry about it. It's all fine. Good. So a pleasure to be speaking with you again. The last time we spoke was a few years ago. Um, it was either kind of just before COVID or one of, or like maybe after the first lockdown or something like that. So a lot has changed. And last time you were still under the umbrella of Third Way. Now you're Anomaly. Um, I know that there's been a kind of a big restructuring of the business. There's been an uncoupling of the brand. 
uh, you guys continue to be one of the disruptive forces in in the UK for office fit outs and producing an extraordinary caliber of really cool, sexy looking um, office buildings and you're being lapped up by lots of developer commercial clients all over the all over the place and I remember last time when I visited your office I was just massively impressed with the the kind of business acumen the way that the business was being set up the way that you were being very thoughtful and commercially minded and also retaining a very strong sense of design identity in all of the work that that you're doing so I guess my first question is it was like why the why the big change what happened what was what what well let's start what was what has been the change is it just been a superficial name change and what was the 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 thoughts what's been the strategic play behind it do you want me to take this one Pete I think yeah you kick it yeah I think I suppose one of the good things to come out of the pandemic uh, it, it allowed people a bit more time time to think of I suppose we weren't perhaps as heads down in the business as usual in the, the sort of the projects you were describing then there were kind of moments that you could be a bit more I suppose introspective or worse kind of navel gazing and spending a bit too much time on it but what it did allow us to kind of take a sit, sit back and say okay are we still doing the right thing with the third way link and while as much as we were doing that from our side the third way business themselves were doing it they were going through obviously that business is much more reliant than we are on the actual office um fit out sector and while that was i suppose at its lowest during that period mm-hmm. both businesses i guess said what are we doing are we doing the right thing are we doing it for the right reasons and this kind of coupled at the same time with some of that growth that you were talking about i suppose from that three to four year period of projects for us getting larger um being procured in different ways, perhaps some of the turnkey setup that worked really well with Third Way in that first couple of years wasn't working so well, but actually all the same benefits were there. This idea, and I suppose we'll talk a bit about it in this, about that kind of unashamed commerciality that we have, um, Mm -hmm. the fact that we didn't want a website until we had some real projects. We never wanted to be paper-based architects, all these principles that we were founded to were still very much true. We were just going in a different trajectory, I suppose, from a business perspective of how things were tended, how, how they were. So it felt like the right time to do it. And I suppose the nice thing was both sides or both all aspects of the business group came together in a really coherent way. And it wasn't, a, a, we haven't fallen out with them. For example, <laughs> It wasn't this big kind of theatrical, we hate you moment. Um, it was a real, I suppose, there was a calm with it, wasn't there, Pete? Yeah, I, I think the um, it was the 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 nice piece of it is, though we have gone through a massive, you know, um, growth period as well. They've been very successful. They've been running what thirteen, fourteen, fifteen years, and they are an incredibly successful designer build office fit out firm. Me and Liam, you know, since running this practice for the past six and a half years, we've had, you know, really great success. And it's been a real privilege to be a part of that. We've been involved in some really interesting and exciting schemes across London and, and beyond. Mm-hmm. And where we were sharing sort of part of that brand, it was, there was a, a mutual benefit within that the, those first real three years. But as Third Way were really focusing on what they were really good at, which is, you know, on the fit outside of, of you know internal fit outside of buildings predominantly we were looking at actually much larger more complex retrofit buildings that were going into their sort of five to 25 million pound projects which didn't fit the profile of uh, design build practice that is a really good problem to have for both parties they want to continue to be successful within their market and we want to continue to be successful in our market so being able to sit you know or stand their own two feet and being you know separate but very successful businesses actually the the rebrand of that was to kind of focus and you know define that we are a standalone design and architecture business that is still has a sister company that we are still very much you know our parent company um still say within the same office but we are doing different things um and that's been actually quite a nice moment 
So perhaps you could you could outline then the way it was and the structure, how it was previously, and what exactly has been the shift. Yeah, I think when we, I mean, the key thing is, even from day one, we were separate companies and separate entities. Right. And I think that often often gets lost in the story that because <laughs> I suppose Pete and I just kind of didn't have a better idea for a name on day one. <laughs> and, and, as, and as Pete said, there was, um, there was a real kind of mutual benefit of being part of that ecosystem. Third Way sure. had already existed. It was a juggernaut. It had a kind of client base there that we tapped into so quickly and almost accelerated our growth. I think within our first three years, we'd built out 10 or so projects, which is kind of unheard of in some of those kind of smaller setups. So that that part of it was was great. I think what we were also exploring at the time was, I guess, part of that disruptive attitude of do, do things need to take as long during tender processes? And the whole, I suppose, third way mission at that time was to grow its construction arm into different fields and different areas and almost align with us and other elements of the group that came in to offer either a full turnkey solution. So that's obviously from cradle to grave in terms of a full project, like almost entirely managed mm -hmm. through to various versions of that. And I think that in some ways is the real key differentiator that changed. So it was the idea that the decoupling of that we were always linked to that. And I think the, the kind of main thing, I suppose, building on something Pete said is this, uh, the brand change gives us our own narrative or it allows us to have our own narrative and a really good client of ours um jit sorry go so, so was it was that always the case previously when you were under the third way brand that um that so third way remind me the the different segments of it you've got kind of interior fit out you guys the architecture there's a real estate component well, there, was. Yeah, there, was. there was there was there was yeah, yeah. and that, and I think this is this is that moment of, of kind of change that we're talking about and flux of um, there was an idea, this idea, set, call it seven years ago, eight years ago, where mm -hmm. all these things come together mm -hmm. and they did. And in lots of instances, it worked really well. Some of our best projects perhaps were delivered through that. Provost Street is a beautiful example of a Victorian warehouse that we extended by a couple of floors. We were technically part client architect interior designer and contractor for that this is, this and is then ended we, up we visited didn't we pete uh, yes yeah, yeah 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 we did okay yeah yeah i remember so and again in, and that's kind of the proof of the concept that it could work but i think what was happening to pete's point is we were growing into worlds where third way wouldn't feel comfortable tender in it but then in some instances and i think this is kind of a key not critique, but it was a key big point for us. We were getting held back occasionally by what people thought they knew we did. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's a real key one. That third way as a brand was really is really strong. But people naturally just assumed on, on a couple of instances perhaps we even before we'd entered the room, people thought they knew what we did. Yeah. Because they knew a story of, of third way. I think that's a that's a um that's actually happened quite a few times to the point of, you know, most projects aren't just one client. You, know, you might have a DM and AM, but they're funded by you know, a, a, a foreign uh, a foreign fund. They might just type in third way or have an idea what it, what it was, and we're trying to bid or trying to develop a, you know, like I said, a 20 million pound scheme, which is two, three floors on top, massing at the back. And they go, Why have I, what the fuck have I got a fit out company doing this? Like, that's insane. And it's there's no point having that argument you know, because they always made it mind up, you know, the initial perception is everything. So it was a really hard work mm. to do that when they could just go to the likes of BGYs, different Javelin to have a really easy conversation to say, look, we're getting the, the best outfits to work on this. And I think where we changed that brand, it was almost an immediate uplift in the, the types of works that we engaged on and the ease of the conversation of which we could have it. And we often talked around as we suffered through COVID, as everyone did, as it was starting to get a sense of coming out of it, that's when we had, you know, uh, engaged in this full rebrand and actually what we were going to do and what we were focusing on. As we launched the brand, we pitched on five major retrofit jobs, each circa like 500,000 pounds of, of fee value. 
all those for major um, developers, either institutional funds or you know, or fairly well established family funds. And we won three of them without any sort of equivocation around our capacity or ability to do that. No conversation around, are we a fit out firm? We are a standalone traditional architecture practice. And that really set the tone. And we won them within three weeks of each other. So it was a massive pivot for us in terms of, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Have we made the wrong decision? Should we've kept that brand? Because there were so many benefits mm. for us. And there was a slight nervousness and we had you know, number of conversations with our CEO on the matter as well around whether it was the right or wrong thing to do. And actually, as they came in, it was very much a, yeah, this is, this is right. And off the back of those, again, we've seen that sort of cyclical growth um, over the past two, two and a half years. And I think, I think weirdly, it's been mutually beneficial too. Yeah. And I think it, this comes down to the, the underwrite here is the owning your own narrative and owning your own brand is actually probably way more important than we we kind of thought. I think in those early years, I think from a business perspective, the allure or the shine of having a, a kind of pre-made black book of clients was obviously the key kind of driver for being part of the juggernaut. But then when it reaches a point that our own our own identity, I suppose, was um, not held back in any way, because on a day to day basis, it was the yeah, I was going to use the example, Pete, a, a really good client of ours, Jamie, said the, the kind of new brand allows us that second line. And I think that was such a, a kind of clever thing to say in the sense that even if that the, the, their first response is who are anomaly, mm -hmm. it gives us the opportunity to say who we are. Mm -hmm. While we were third way, there was an element of, like Peter uh, again alluded to, people might have known a version of it or they might get a different version. And we were almost coming from, not behind the eight ball, but we were coming from a position where we maybe had to over explain what we were and actually by having our own ownable thing in the same way that, yeah, Buckley Gray Ehrman do, Stephen Trevitt, all, all these amazing architecture practices, it just maybe allowed us to compete on a fairer level with them. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting. It's it's very yeah. difficult to kind of, you know, when you've, when you've got a strong, already well-established brand and there's been a, a new kind of niche or a new kind of service offering that's been developed to not always be thought of what the original brand was. I mean, it's very rare that you see that in business. I mean, Virgin's probably the, one of the, like an exception to a company that actually does it quite well, where you've got, you know, you've got Virgin TV, Coke and Virgin Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. Co Coke to airplanes. It's, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a, a quite, quite unusual. Um, but the, the, the power of the, of an existing brand and you're always kind of competing, competing with it. And that wasn't necessarily the intention of what you set up the architecture space for could totally, yeah. that, to that totally makes a lot of, a lot of sense. How I think actually what was, um, sorry, I, I was going to say what was actually interesting at that time was that, um, the, the, it was a two way debate. It was actually, right. as we were doing the rebrand exercise was do we lean so hard into the third way brand and drop all the sub names and everything just becomes third way. Mm. And it's almost like, uh, like sky or something like that. It's a name, it's a, a brand, or do we go entirely the opposite way? And I think it's, it, that process was really interesting actually going through it with a couple of branding agencies on the benefit of each. And I think we're in the right place now, a hundred percent. Could, but could the you merits could, of age yeah could you walk us through that process that you went through with the branding agency and and what were the, the the benefits of each and why you decided to to go the pathway you did yeah of course i think um again like i suppose having a, a little bit more time to be introspective or reflective actually allowed us to weigh up the things that had worked and hadn't that on a day-to-day -day you just kind of steamroll over and it's like, okay, that's not quite working, but it's almost there. Whereas when I guess an external company, I suppose we're probably in some ways for our branding agency, probably one of the worst clients that they worked with at the time, because we think we can do it. Like we would, it's like, oh, we're creative. We can come up with some great ideas. We don't need you. And, um, actually that early discovery process was so fantastic. We worked with, um, step ladder on our brand and they were great at, um, just listening initially and presenting things back to us that were in different directions. And I think Pete, you and I both said at that time, it was just actually someone else replaying your story was a great thing to then 
hear back and say, oh, actually, that's way more important than I thought it was. It was it was one of the most enjoyable things I think we've done actually as a practice. And it was a, it came at a time actually having gone through that first cycle, you know, COVID or otherwise, you know, we'd gone through a three, four year cycle at the point. You know, we'd we'd grown very quickly, we had lots of success. We may be growing too quickly, um, you know, uh, on reflection and actually what they're able to do, it was almost like couples, couples counseling, you know, we were sat in a room together. We weren't too, you know, we had different ideas of what we were good at or what, what successes may have been. And it was nice to have been given the time to, to sit back and actually reflect of what we had done really well, areas that we hadn't done so well. Um, and actually what we want to do in the future. I think we got, you can get so caught up in trying to win the next project, trying to grow in a, in a successful manner that being focused actually can be far more beneficial for the long run rather than trying to, you know, trying to win everything. You know, we were looking at mm-hmm. anything to, to a degree if we thought it, it might have work at the end of it. And actually part of that cycle was around being exacting on what we wanted to go and what we wanted the brand to, 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 to be. And it came as wants to be experts in commercial retrofit office and everything really started to kind of focus on that key point and you know resulted like i say in a really nice kick of work so it was um it was an interesting process which i think was it nine months it went on for yeah and i think on the like to to go back to your question i think the the like the opposite side of that in terms of the benefit of doing the all consuming brand is almost the exact opposite in a way of rather than being very focused on okay this is exactly what we want it was almost how can we be everything to everyone but in in a way that doesn't water down the brand too much mm-hmm. and actually that the kind of leaning into the third way aspect was we almost become this kind of powerhouse company where someone could come to the front door and say i need to do x y or z and we'd almost take you into the labyrinth and there'd be the answer within there. And, and they're very, very different uh, branding stories in a way that right. the anomaly narrative allowed us to be, I suppose, much more, uh, much more Pete than our, the, our personalities and also the personality of the team mm-hmm. is very, very front and center. Whereas the branding story for something a lot bigger you're appealing to so many different people. You almost have to leave quite a lot of like blank space for people to fill in their own story in there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, um, I think at that time it was a really interesting, I'm certainly glad we went the way we did, but it would be interesting to see how the last four years would have gone if we went the other way. How, how did you change the actual business and legal structure then? Because previously Third Way was like a majority owner of the of third way architecture was that the case mm. and is that nothing is, are they are they like now more like investors or like and, and what what stopped you for example being completely independent i think there's always i, I mean the legal structures kind of ebb and flow behind the scenes on like with the setup and relationship we have with third way i think Pete's alluded to this, we are still part of the family of companies, as you call it now, or the house of brands or any of these analogies. And we've got so much in common in that we've still got the same sort of vested interest in third way doing well. I think from a day to day perspective, it was almost that full cutting loose of uh, our reporting to um, and governance, the idea that actually Third Way as a company brought in a non-exec board, which has been probably one of the most fantastic things to happen. Again, to that point of the branding, right? Someone else mm-hmm. replaying your story from externally allows you to get rid of the whole echo chamber and just the self-validation that sometimes comes mm-hmm. in this industry. It's like, yeah, sure, it's the right idea. Let's just keep doing it. Someone else telling you that. So I- we, I suppose, from our reporting, it becomes tighter, yeah. but more autonomous. I think that's I think that's a really key point there. Um, that it's amazing how often we get asked, why why don't we just break away? Why don't we just do our own thing? As if that is just innately good, because I think people are obsessed by the idea of ownership and being able to hmm. have this kind of idea of we're free to do what we like. That's always and actually 
the 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 point of being within that part, you know, wider group, and actually, especially with the the governance and the board piece, is accountability. Being being challenged and being questioned around not just the design we do, but actually how we you know operate the business on a day to day, on terms of how we do feature planning, or you know our business development, whatever it might be. It's it's been so fruitful to us on an operational level to have that being challenged and questioned by those that they don't need to be impressed by our design. They don't care about, you know, if I'm in, you know, out for a beer with them or whatever, they don't care, which is great. What they care about is is the management of the business and how that's going to be reported on. And it's made me and Liam question how we, you know, engage clients, how we, you know, instruct or provide fee proposals, how we engage in different projects, the types of you know, geographically, where we're going to try and operate in the the type of work that we're going to have a look at, whether it's it's always going to be office or we start to look at, you know, BTR schemes and the value in that. And then again, being, doing that not just for our own ego or we think this sort of this random margin we're going to find in it, but go, where's the business case in that? Where's the risk in that? Where's the long-term sort of um, value in, in doing these different things? And I think that's given us far more value to do to be much more freer and have the autonomy to explore these things by having those restrictions weirdly then if we said see you later we're going to do it on our own and i think it's interesting that most people will still always go down cut cut your ties do your own thing you're going to be happier um which i, I find yeah i don't think i could yeah i, could I think there's a number of benefits aren't there I, 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 yeah i think that's Pete's made a really interesting point about that whole um, autonomy of decision making. Like the architecture profession is so divisive, isn't it? When it comes to is it an art, is it a business, is it whatever? And you get you get a real spectrum of um, of people along the way. And I guess it's the entire focus of this podcast in some ways that mm-hmm. actually having that external party once removed and then almost twice removed again in the sense of a, a non-exec board to ask you questions of saying okay is that right if it is sure that's great you kind of crack on and do it if not perhaps you should think about x y and z is actually way more freeing than it is restrictive because it takes some of that perhaps doubt or imposter syndrome or some whatever version of that might exist if you're sat in your own bubble, it kind of takes it away and you you almost answer it then as an academic question of, all right, actually, I, I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. And I think that's kind of the second part of the benefit in a way that it just allows us a bigger soundboard. It, mm-hmm. What we do is so interesting, so reliant on people, it's so reliant on tenants, it's so reliant on occupiers, like Pete said, in BTR, in hotel, in um, commercial, in a wider spectrum this whole thing acts as just a big soundboard so as we are designing something we're constantly garnering opinion on is is it the right thing to do is this aligned with what you're doing from a kind of tenant perspective is this the cat b teams that are doing really really quick fit outs pete says it all the time cat b leads cat a leads architecture we're actually in that kind of ecosystem Mm -hmm. within our own kind of again autonomous bubble so yeah, we feel quite privileged in that sense. I don't think it's a completely rec- replicable business model because it's quite unique in some ways. Well, I, but I there's think, definitely benefits of it. I, I think you know. I, I think Pete, you've made some good points here about the. There is a sort of perception that you know breaking away and being completely independent is somehow the 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 pinnacle, um, and and from a creative. Um, profession that's often the misunderstanding i think and i think i think a lot of business strategies you know quite frankly have happened as a result of perpetuating that myth that you know and and we see it all the time of you know people having the great idea i'm going to start a, a, a creative business and then they do and then it's 15 years of struggle and strife and difficulties and actually partnering with other businesses being part of a group being part of there's the the amount you know the amount that you can get done the the kind of compound effect that exists with a with a network of other businesses and being part of it and also your business intelligence 
how quickly that compounds and grows and also the networks and relationships it's well, why wouldn't you do that there's 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 an enormous amount of of um of, of kind of yeah opportunity really i think massively so i think again like we've both been through the kind of ringer of architectural education and you, you kind of come out of it with all these great ideas and so few of them relate to actually how something's going to get done and i think it's that i suppose the expectation that if you do start your own practice you are you know everything about the ins and outs of business the ins and outs of hr the ins and outs of how to do architecture right and then actually taking a step back from that and saying i'm probably not the best person to be making these decisions <laughs> or even if i even if i am i i could probably do with a bit of a second or third opinion and even if it's even if it's not the same construct we have right actually having these conversations about it but and again going back to something we talked about with our website very very early on about we didn't want to have paper-based work up there actually understanding what then gets a project from paper-based to being built Mm -hmm. And it comes back to this kind of commercialities. I don't think it's being crass. I think it's just understanding what makes a client's project work. Because you can, again, you might have the best idea. You might be chasing it and you kind of practice by yourself and think it's absolutely the right thing to do. And it's just not quite aligned. Um, that was a massive learning curve for us early on. And it's stuck so true to what we do now. So how does the, in, in terms of winning work under the brand of Anomaly, and you know, first, actually, where, where did the name come from? And what has, you know, how, how does the winning work process altered as a result of being kind of an independent appearance? Do you want me to do the brand on yeah. you? I think, again, from that process we did with the branding agency where, um, we almost allow it like Pete referred to it perfectly as couples therapy. We, we sort of sat a little bit like this talking for a couple of hours about our story, where things had come from and stepladder at the time, just almost listened and, um, took away a few kind of key, key themes and came back. Was it three or four ideas initially they had? Well, they, well, I mean, names wise, it was, I think it was like a 90 or so, it was almost just like a, a, yeah. a full full roster but then they honed in yeah on three three sort of brand concepts with under a name um about that was yeah. it wasn't it there was sort of a three or four kind of themes that were to do with things we'd said some of them about uh that we're very kind of personable people we really like to get on with clients the idea of that being a kind of core theme there was an idea that we were i suppose quite disruptive and trying to be quite pioneering in the way we did, did things as another theme which took a different direction and then this it, what I, again in pete's list as we he was talking about there was yeah maybe 20 names in this final category which was all about i think they refer to it as the outlier it was this idea that we we didn't quite fit a mold we weren't from here we weren't from there we'd done we'd been brave enough to do things a little bit different but we weren't uh absolute aggravators so it kind of was this almost outlier and one of the first names i think it was the first name on that list actually was anomaly and we were like okay the job's really easy it's that one it's like the top one um and from there then obviously the, the, the entire brand identity and um narrative defined around it um a lot of people can't say it even more people can't spell it which is fine that's like totally fine o, o's and a's everywhere so um we've kind of learned the hard way on that from it's a bit of a mouthful sometimes what's the, what's i think the, even what, from what's the, the what's the funniest mispronouncing you've had i think it's where yeah should, it's where people should i not got, ask oh is it where, yeah it's probably from pete to be yeah right. probably i mean i'm, I'm it's, <laughs> yeah don't ever read my docs i mean it's this uh, the car crash of spelling but never mind um works the right <laughs> just just can't can't write yeah but, it, it, but yeah, I yeah. think that first the first pitch we did with it was was great because everything we'd been saying and have been saying in this about narrative, it was all ours. It was all our story. It, it, the brand gives us enough freedom for me and Pete to be very different, mm -hmm. which was exactly the crux of the business and is the crux of everyone we employ. Everyone has room within 
that kind of anomaly brand to be the, I think one of our taglines is um, traditional architecture, new direction, which just allows, it's not about entirely reinventing the wheel. It's just about saying, okay, there are new ways to do this. There's new ways to think about everything. Uh, it's, 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 Why it's, it's that reflection. On, yeah. I think the, the, yeah, to build on that, it's a reflection of what we're trying to encourage, I guess, the company culture of everyone within the team. And this is something that has stayed resolutely since we started is, you know, the things that we didn't like maybe from traditional practice, um, and the idea of, I guess, from however junior, however green that you have, you have a voice, you have something to say, there is an opinion within every individual that can be of, of value and of benefit that can change the status quo, can change the hierarchy of or whoever's hosting the meeting. Um, and part of, you know, anomaly as a, as a faceless brand in terms of it's not Spencer as a Pizzito. you know, it means that anyone can, can own it. And then part of, you know, any design, we don't have a set start. It's really important for us as a business to continually encourage any individual team working on a project that we really push a process. The process is very much about testing and validating and evidencing the commercial drivers of any one scheme. But how it looks should be reflective of, you know, the brief drivers, you know, limitations of the building, whatever that is. But to maintain, you know, obviously an exemplar quality of design. And so, you know, the outlier, anomaly is the outlier. It's, it means that, again, any individual within the practice can occupy that brand, occupy that name and push these designs and give full agency to it. I think that's been a really nice play on it. Um, and so, like I said, I think people have brought into it. And again, some of that honesty and candor from actually that time when, again, coming out of the back end of the pandemic, where there's been a lot of kind of false hope and just outright lies, right? That had been sort of so public. Our brand is just so hinged on we are who we are. And, and there's a beautiful honesty in that, in saying, we really love what we do. We're going to have fun while we do it. And why not? <laughs> Projects last such a long time with people that in the first instance, you don't really know. If you're going out in the first instance to be really contractual and really, um, I suppose, by the, by the book and, and very, okay, this is a, a very stiff structure. The minute that comes unpicked, it's just not a, an enjoyable process. I think you kind of have to remember that, yeah, people are at the root of all of these projects from the project team to contractors to the end users. Actually, let's just, let's be more people about it and allow those individuals in the team from the very, the most junior person we have all the way through to, I guess, our, our technical delivery team. Each person has a, a kind of voice in that. And again, going back to your question on what that meant for job with, and it just allowed us to, to put that in front of clients in a way which was quite, I think, refreshing in, in a sense that I'm not going to say it's pioneering. I'm not going to say that there are other practices similar to us who say similar things, because there are. Mm -hmm. And and it, it's nice to have that kind of healthy competition in the bracket that we sit. I think it just allowed us to pitch in a way which was almost just felt so natural. We weren't trying to be, any, I wasn't trying to be Pete, Pete wasn't trying to be me. Um, and, and, and that in a kind of job winning sense, I think is so important. In terms of brand, and the importance of brand in actually seducing winning winning work. Could you explain it's that role a little? Like you've you kind of started to point point towards it. How do you now use the anomaly brand to open doors, if you like? I think with like uh, it, it's tricky, isn't it? Because people like, and I care a lot about this. Like. I, as much probably should be in brand development as much as architecture, I think sometimes. But um, I think there's there's a point in which we, and I, I'll, I'll be quite candid, we were losing work to more known names mm -hmm. because people want to buy a product. And again, we can dress architecture up as all these different things. But at the end of the day, there is a product there that people want to pay money for a Buckley Gray Omen building because they know that brand is associated with quality it's associated with great things for us to compete on that playing field we needed our own 
brand that was almost could compete with fashion brands right and that was our right. brief in some ways to the branding agency and pete's rocking some of our summer 2023 merch at the minute that actually being able to use it in a different way that feels beyond like pete said our names or like quite a stiff right. kind of corporate heading allowed it to be quite fun playful the icon and, and the use of it actually we probably played it down early on that people cared about that and actually, for to be able to market a building to say, oh, it's an, on, an anomaly building, like even I'm tripping over it, but actually to be able to put it in a brand bracket and own that is, yeah, I think there's an importance to it that goes beyond a document or a, um, a, a header. I think it's, it's interesting that that point around association of brand that people, you know, this is this is anecdotal only. So you get a real sense, especially now with that rebrand, that people want to have us, especially even on like when they're trying to sell a building, we'll, we'll work on doing a feasibility study to do that most of the time at spec, that anomaly are going to be working on this. It's not, oh, we've got an architect to do this thing. No, we have actually got anomaly into this because it shows that there's a commercial awareness to, to, to unpick all the value. And so by that word of mouth, having a, the strength and the depth within the association of the brand means that we're being spoken about without us in the room. And the innate value of just having an association of us on a project is starting to kind of come through. Not for a second that we're saying we're up there with, you know, age member above us. You know, we are tears away from that. But there's a growing, I guess, engagement with the type of the work we're doing and the scale of the work that we're doing that is comparable to those that we always want to be, you know, seen next to. You know, they are aspirational, yeah. you know, practices, different Javelin, Hawkins Brown, BGY. For a long time, they were like, well, how do we ever get there? And I think in a nice way now is we're nipping at their heels on their, obviously probably their smaller stuff, but very much can be in competition with them for a speculative building. And the anomaly mm -hmm. brand isn't seen as the also ran. It's very much a seen very much next to that they can offer uh, a quality of scheme that is they is worth in, uh, investing in. And I think it's asking that question again, using the, the fashion analogy, just to break out of our industry, because I think that's always so important to use other comparative examples that are just on the kind of day to day, why would someone buy? It's the white t-shirt thing, right? Like you could buy a white t-shirt from a high street shop or you could pay 20 times that to buy a designer label. And people do that. People have buying patterns, people have brand association patterns. It's absolutely no different in our industry that people at times, even if you're part up like pound for pound, absolutely on par in terms of quality of output, a brand might be the thing that sometimes just pushes that into that next level because it's, they can badge it in a certain way, like Pete said, mm -hmm. and it can become something different because of the brand association. And I think we, yeah, we probably for too long pushed against that. And we, we thought it doesn't matter as part of the third way thing. It's, it's all right. Our quality will come through. Mm -hmm. But when we were going up against these amazing kind of competitors, we were losing out because on a couple of instances where people were like, oh, well, people know their name, so we're going to go with them. Yeah, that's so that's so interesting. And it was, abs it's, you know, it's when we start to look at client buying behavior or consuming behavior um, and this idea of, you know, the brand actually, it, it has an enormous impact on people's consuming consumer habits because people do not buy logically people do not buy things just purely on utilitarian there's something else that we that we want and it's a kind of you know um all of us when we purchase whatever brand is that we're purchasing there's this little bit of identity shift that happens and fashion's probably the biggest example of this because at the end of the day clothing is you know there's a utilitarian um function there's a utility to it and people are, as you say, willing to spend uh, thousands of pounds on a coat where they could have bought it the same thing from Primark. But yeah, but you want this, the, the status, the, the wearing the, the Burberry the coat or, or something, you know, another, another kind of high-end brand. It's a, that's who you become wearing that coat 
and who, who you communicate yourself to be is totally different from from the from the prime mark and to to kind of deny that clients go through that is you know it's at our own detriment for sure i think it's that it's it's understanding it again goes back to that commerciality point not just from a, a numbers perspective but risk and decision making as much as obviously we're the again something we did early and we're really glad we did is really try to understand that buy, that buying pattern you're talking about what mm -hmm. actually when a when a client is considering buying a building or starting a project what hurdles do they have to go through and actually in our day-to-day -day, a lot of them just <laughs> they can seem quite dry they can seem quite excel led a lot of risk management really but then if you we're a tiny part of that puzzle but if you're you've got an hour allocated to assess four businesses what are the things that are going to stand out and it's it's often that time of how much can you portray through brand recognition or other people knowing it but also then backing that up with the work right and i think that's where the the beauty of the last couple of years has been for us in terms of saying we know we're not exactly the safe choice all the time and, and I think that, again, from a, an honest understanding, if we're going up against practices that have been established for 10, 15, 20 years, we know we're coming from behind on that. But actually, mm -hmm. if people that are well-respected in the industry, which we're very lucky to have as a lot of our clients, are talking about us in a way that make people raise an eyebrow, and then all of a sudden you see this quite cool pack of work and well branded well put out hmm. actually that's that's incredible the the we've had it on a number of occasions haven't we pete where we're just baffled at how far a document we have sent to someone has yeah. gone without our control right that that's very that's very interesting the the, the kind of power of the brand and how it want how it makes clients want to share it want to share it want to want to spread it around and again it's this is what we're exactly what we're talking about with the with the clothing is people want to be associated with a particular brand because it's elevating them it's making yeah. them look good it's making them and i think know, that shouldn't be downplayed like, as in yeah. it, it absolutely shouldn't be downplayed as a concept right we we can maybe get overly apologetic sometimes about saying oh because we're doing good stuff it makes them look good. Actually, again, some of our clients that we've become very close to, they want to look good to their peers and to their own bosses. And by appointing a, a practice that do well and are cool, actually, let's not hide behind the fact that actually it is a good thing for them. It's, um, yeah, it's mutually beneficial for sure. Very good. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about the how the internal structure then has changed and has there been a, a you know how, how what's the size of the practice now what happened in terms of kind of staff members how has that changed so i think when when uh we got to covid so the month before that with we'd hired i think on average about one person a month so we were 30 32 mm -hmm. people and that was part of you know again significant success but also a very aggressive growth pattern um and it was exciting and you know all that sort of good stuff as covid really bit we had a number of um sort of very i guess large-scale projects one being um uh, Deloitte's new office building, so about 300,000 square feet of which was bankrolling about six or seven individuals within the business. That stopped, I think, two months after COVID. And then all the other speculative schemes or elements going through stage two or three before we got to site also got stopped. And I think we ended up at our very lowest point at six of us um, altogether. Um, and that was... And that, shouldn't, and that shouldn't be downplayed about how big that was to go from wow yeah like 30s to yeah. kind of single digits again we were almost back in the in the kind of kitchen table moment of everyone being around and um a very different business but I, uh, yeah sure I, I think it's, it was amazing and it was amazing it was it was and it, it's that with all, you always want to say oh, it was good time in terms of that that self-reflective piece but you know 
all the horror and the, the pain and the anguish of, of COVID. <laughs> and, you know, it was, you know, this is the first business that me and Liam have, have run and we have not gone through a, a process of having to make people redundant, you know, people that we'd work with very closely and, and really enjoy their company and we're about to take away their jobs um, for no fault of their own is fucking shit. Um, and it's mm-hmm. really fucking shit for them. And it's, you know, we're not as bad for us because we're still working, but that, that re- it was horrible. And it was the, it was a really challenging time to kind of go through that. And also for the people that stayed, you know, well, how much job protection did they have? How, how secure did they feel? We didn't even know what's going on. People were asking us around what the, the future of the business is going to be. And frankly, we didn't know because the work just wasn't there as we were in, busy looking at anything and everything but as again as we started that rebrand process and things were starting to come come out of it it just worked in a really nice time and as we started to kind of re-gear and get people back in the rebrand and the refocus of what we're trying to do also bled out led out rather through the um to the team about thinking around who was going to be working within the practice, the type of uh, work and process that we're going to do, again, slightly shifted. We had a very fluid, I guess, we tried to say a non, you know, uh, a non-hierarchical business at the start, but I think people didn't know where they stood. They didn't know how they were going to grow. They didn't know who was responsible for what. Because again, we're almost in that, you know, fairly obvious rejection to traditional practice. Hey, everyone could do everything. This is great and very exciting. And actually, a lot of feedback was, no, no, I do want some structure. I do want some accountability. I do want to know where it's going on. Very much like what me and Liv just said about the board. Well, actually, it's great to have feedback yeah. and critique and where do I grow? How do I you know, develop? And so it's the balance here is not clinically hierarchical in terms of you can't do this because you're a junior. We have juniors pitching, leaning on projects, coming to client meetings, taking things on. But if they are screwed or worried about something, you know, they know they can go to an associate or they can get support from, from a variety of different people. And we also made a real key decision around how we were going to hire. And I think because we'd grown so quickly, we had hired, uh, I think, always based on immediate need. And so some people were really great for certain projects, but maybe they weren't part of i guess the the culture that we were looking for they would they were excellent at doing xyz but maybe they wanted a different kind of way of working and that wasn't maybe what would enable us to thrive and it's kind of trying to say not being mean about any personal individual but we wanted to really privilege the culture that we wanted to nurture how we wanted to operate and putting that in a way that if we can make that really successful it will attract the type of employees that we want to work with and so we, there were definitely times over the past 18 24 months where we weren't hiring we didn't have the, a, a big enough team because we were being so careful around the type of group we want to engage but we've now got to a point where I, I love the idea that i would hang out with any one person in the team and have a beer with individually um or have a drink with because actually they everyone's got that same sort of drive and work ethic and uh i guess persona that that works for us um and i think that's that's been a really nice um shift um for the business and i, th- and I think the, the 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 kind of second layer of people that we put in we we're very lucky that we have a, a formidable set of kind of associates that kind of work with us and Amy, who is now our associate director, almost in in many ways, kind of runs the output of the studio and is again to, to Pete's point and to my point earlier about having a counterpoint. This has never been about the Liam and Pete show. I think at times it spiraled into versions of that through circumstance, but actually then having Amy as a bit of a figurehead to say, okay, sense check this, and then the likes of Lucy, who kind of runs our interiors team, these people that actually are probably way more important on a day-to-day basis for the the overall studio than we are, actually giving them the autonomy and the 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 uh, I suppose the position to be able to say, okay, this is how how we're going to do this, allowed us to grow around these quite key pivots. So yeah, from where we were at six, we're back up at twenty-two now. I think is yeah. it? Pete? Yeah. 
22. So actually that regrowth again has been quite fast, but it's been in a completely different way, a very, very organic way, but one that we feel to Pete's point where, yeah, we love the team to pieces. I think that's the, the kind of the great that, part. Of well, it. I mean, I mean, that's, that's a real, a really interesting kind of cycle of, of growth and contraction to actually go through 31 down to six then back to 22 and actually the amount of insight that you get from going through that and you know not many businesses actually have the opportunity to to kind of restructure themselves in in that way and kind of change the way that governance is working internally and kind of going for a a rebrand i think that's really you know it's it's very that's a it's quite a unique it's a unique business story if you like um, and lessons. they're different businesses at different businesses at different scales. I think that's the the big thing. And again, as part of this um, growth in our association to the wider business, we're able mm. to benefit from uh, perhaps business knowledge sharing and things like that, that perhaps some other smaller practices might not. And what's mm. so interesting about that divide from, say, six to 20 is the kind of needs of the business are so different. And I think a lot of businesses that perhaps struggle in that middle bit is by not acknowledging them that actually it's a very different thing. And we're probably on the cusp of, I think it's named something happily like the Valley of Death or something like that beyond where we are in, in the kind of the 30 people, you might as well then be kind of a hundred or mm-hmm. 200 because all the systems and processes are in place. So we're often flirting with this size and so many other, I suppose, practices are around that kind of growth point because all of a sudden you're not that kitchen table practice you're not in everyone's business you don't know the ins and outs of every project and the amount of trust you put in different business channels from associates and project leads becomes so much bigger but it becomes scalable because you're effectively just adding to those channels rather than doing it in that way and i think yeah, we, we kind of like that moment, <laughs> yeah, teetering on the edge of it um, happily. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think that's the, the perfect place to conclude. Just quickly, things that you're looking forward to in 2024. 20, Good one, isn't it? Tr- a tricky market yeah. to, to be objectively um, forward looking. I think through, through all kind of times of adversity and a bit of kind of market uncertainty come amazing opportunities and I think architects architectural designers interior designers are always really well positioned to 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 uh, grow and thrive in these times so it might feel like a bit of a overly poetic answer but I think actually with so much tricky market uncertainty there will be some amazing opportunities to come out of it yeah uh, uh, but the, I think to second that it's yeah the, the way all the projects that we won when we ch- we rebranded are now uh, starting to be on site they're looking to be completed by the end of next year so all that hard work and sort of that strife we've gone through so we architects through covid rebranded won these really significant key projects have now got to become you know materialized into physical things and it's again just not forgetting actually it's not always about winning the next thing about always looking to the the you know years down the line it's i always keep coming back to just being content being i mean what we've done is i'm i'm so utterly thrilled and proud of like the people we get to work with the jobs we get to do it's stupid because it's so weirdly cool and mad and interesting and now these things are going to be built um and to get to enjoy that and uh just see these things um, be done. I think that actually for me, that's going to be a key, key bit to look forward to. Awesome. Brilliant. I think, thank you very much for your time and expertise and sharing this, the story there. That's been really, really fascinating. I can't believe the time has gone so quickly, but uh, I hope to be doing this. We'll have another conversation in a, in a few more years to see the next, uh, the next stages of evolution. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Good to chat. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information.
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable. <laughs>